Light from the sun is the source of energy for all living things on Earth. Plants use this light energy to produce their own food. Because of this, plants are known as producers. Animals can't make their own food from sunlight. Instead, they get their energy from eating plants and other animals and are known as consumers. So energy passes from the sun to plants and then to animals. Locusts get their energy from eating grass. But what happens to the energy they consume? Like all animals, they convert the food they eat into increased body weight and faeces and release energy through respiration. This energy keeps the locust alive. It's used for movement and lost to the surroundings as heat. So, energy is transferred from the grass to the locust. Some is lost to the surroundings. The rest remains in the locust as increased body weight. The transfer of energy from grass to insect can be measured by taking a locust and weighing it. The mass of this locust is 2.17 grams. The insect is placed into an isolation tank. The grass available for it to eat has a mass of 20.26 grams. It's put into a flask of water to keep it fresh. The locust is left for four days, during which time it eats, breathes, moves, grows and defecates. After four days, all the remaining pieces of grass are collected. The grass not eaten by the locust has a mass of 16.29 grams. This means that the mass of grass eaten is 3.97 grams. Everything in this ecosystem has an amount of energy associated with it. Grass has an energy content of 3 kilojoules per gram. So 3.97 grams of grass contains 11.91 kilojoules of energy. Approximately 12 kilojoules of energy is transferred from the grass to the locust. But how much of this energy was used up and lost to the surroundings through respiration? A respirometer measures the volume of oxygen the locust inhales. It's used to estimate the rate of respiration. A solution of potassium hydroxide in the bottom of the respirometer absorbs all the CO2 breathed out by the locust. As the insect takes in oxygen from its surroundings, the liquid in the manometer will rise up the left-hand side. After 30 minutes, the locust has inhaled enough oxygen to move the red liquid 9 millimetres. A complex calculation shows that this amount of oxygen is associated with the release of 7.15 kilojoules in four days. Approximately 7 kilojoules of energy is used to keep the locust alive. The next step is to find out how much energy was transferred to faeces. The locust's faeces are collected and weighed. They have a mass of 0.2 grams and an energy content of approximately 2 kilojoules. When the locust is weighed, it's found to have an increase in body mass of 0.41 grams. Its energy content has increased by 2 kilojoules. So of the 12 kilojoules transferred from the grass to the locust, 7 was transferred to the surroundings through respiration. 2 was transferred to faeces and 2 was converted to body mass and is now available to the next animal in the food chain. But this only adds up to 11 kilojoules. One kilojoule of energy hasn't been accounted for. The investigation has many inaccuracies. How could you improve the procedure and obtain more reliable results? The element carbon is essential for plants and animals to survive. 
But there's a limited supply of carbon here on Earth. It's recycled by a series of reactions known as the carbon cycle. The atmosphere contains a small amount of carbon dioxide. CO2 in the air is constantly being absorbed by plants. They use it for photosynthesis. Carbon dioxide diffuses into the leaves, where it's built up into sugars and other complex carbon compounds. One way of proving that a plant takes up carbon is to feed it with radioactive CO2. This is produced when dilute acid is added to radioactive hydrogen carbonate solution. Acid plus hydrogen carbonate produces carbon dioxide and water. Any unused CO2 is absorbed by potassium hydroxide solution. This prevents any radioactivity escaping. The whole process is carried out in a fume cupboard. The plant is illuminated and left for a few hours. Remove the plant from the apparatus and it's possible to check it for radioactivity with a Geiger counter. Carbon atoms from the radioactive CO2 gas have become part of the structure of the plant. The carbon dioxide containing radioactive carbon-14 combines with water to form radioactive sugars. In a darkroom, one of the leaves is wrapped in cling film and placed onto a piece of undeveloped photographic film sensitive to radioactivity. After being left in the dark for two days, an image of the leaf has developed. This is further evidence that the radioactive carbon is now a part of the leaf. When a plant is eaten, the carbon compounds are passed on to the animal. Both plants and animals respire. This process returns carbon to the atmosphere in the form of carbon dioxide. The way that animals and plants affect the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere can be shown by a simple demonstration. The level of CO2 is monitored using a hydrogen carbonate indicator. It's reddish-orange when in contact with ordinary air. A leaf is placed in the top of test tube A. In B, a small metal grid is suspended halfway and four wood lice are carefully placed in the tube. Tube C contains both the leaf and four wood lice. Test tube D is the control. It contains no living organisms. All the test tubes are sealed, so there's no chance of any air getting in or out. The tubes are placed in the light and left for several hours. The indicator will detect any changes. Reddish-orange means there's the same amount of carbon dioxide as in the atmosphere. Yellow means there's more carbon dioxide than in atmospheric air. Purple means there's less. So after six hours, how have the levels of carbon dioxide changed in the four tubes? The indicator in A and B is definitely different to the control. In A, the indicator has turned slightly purple. There's now less carbon dioxide inside the tube. So what process has removed CO2? In B, the indicator is yellow. The wood lice have increased the amount of carbon dioxide. Animals respire. They break down sugars and release carbon dioxide into the air. Plants respire as well, but in bright light, they also photosynthesize, taking in CO2. Why has the indicator hardly changed at all in tube C? Another part of the carbon cycle involves decomposition. 
When living things die, they decompose. The carbon they contain is returned to the soil and the air. Forest fires and the burning of fossil fuels also return carbon to the atmosphere. Nitrogen is an essential element for plants and animals. It's needed to make protein and DNA. 78% of the atmosphere is nitrogen gas, but nitrogen is very unreactive and can't be used directly by plants or animals. It needs to be converted into nitrates before most plants can use it. Nitrates in the soil are absorbed by the roots of plants, which then build them up into complex proteins. These tomato plants have been grown in different concentrations of nitrate solution for the same amount of time, but they look quite different. With enough nitrate, the plant is healthy. It's grown tall and bushy. As the nitrate concentration decreases, so too does the health of the plant. So where does the nitrate present in the soil come from? Lightning provides a small amount. It converts nitrogen gas present in the atmosphere directly into nitrates. A more reliable way of increasing the nitrate content of soil is to add fertilizer. Inorganic fertilizer contains nitrates which can be absorbed by plants straight away. Organic fertilizer, like manure, contains dead animal and plant material. As it decays, it releases nitrogen compounds into the soil. A range of bacteria break down the proteins in manure and convert them to ammonium compounds. Ammonium ions contain nitrogen and hydrogen, but for most plants to be able to build up proteins, these need to be converted to nitrates. This is carried out by nitrifying bacteria. Another process involves nitrogen-fixing bacteria. These take up atmospheric nitrogen. Nitrogen-fixing bacteria exist free in the soil or in the roots of certain plants, like clover. Special nitrogen-fixing bacteria, called rhizobium, live in tiny nodules on the roots. The bacteria convert atmospheric nitrogen into ammonium ions and eventually proteins. To show the existence of these bacteria, the outer surface of the nodules must first be sterilised so that only the rhizobium bacteria inside the nodule are alive. After washing in bleach and rinsing with water, a glass rod is used to crush the nodules and liberate the bacteria inside. A loop of wire is heated in a flame to make it completely sterile. It's then dipped into the bacteria and transferred to a sterile plate containing agar. After a few days incubation, the rhizobium has multiplied and is now visible. <laughs>